All right, so we, you know we've been in a series of psalms, and uh, I just think it's incredible how um, you know we, we like doing the curriculums, um, you know, and breaking down different things, and you know that's applicable. But it's just incredible how many answers um, that God already gives us in His Word, and we're going to see that tonight as we break this down. But I titled this "Abiding in the Lord." So in Psalm 16, it says, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will pour out libations of blood to such gods, I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. All right, so just a brief, um, you know, overview of what we're going to go over tonight. So in the psalm here, David's expressing the joy that he finds in the Lord, even in the midst of his trials, the dangers, the potential death that he's faced. Um, If you guys know anything about David, you know that he faced about everything imaginable. Um, And a lot of us have too. But here we see David expressing his joy, the joy that he finds in the midst of all that through the Lord. And David also, you'll see throughout this psalm, Um, that David expresses his need for the Lord and recognizes a world without God in the center of it and the the effects of that. And then one of the most interesting things that I found in this study um, is that the psalm is also a prophecy of the coming Christ, and we'll break that down a little later too. So we'll start in verse 1 here, and it says, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. Do we pray? I know that uh, prayers, especially when we get busy, life's fast, everything's going on in our lives, it's crazy, and it's like we get to the point that we're so overburdened by everything that we try to do things on our own, and I don't think we pray as much as we should. Um, You know, I think it's a problem that most of us have, and, you know, I can speak for myself and say that it's a problem that I have myself. Um, But when we pray, do we pray this way? Do we pray to God, keep me safe, God? Do we turn to God and say, God, it's in you that I take refuge? Do we turn to him and realize um, how fragile and frail that we are and that we need him, um, the creator of all things, to sustain us? Do we come to him in prayer that way? Do we plead with God for protection to start our day every day before we make decisions, before we do anything? Um, I have a friend of mine um, who, uh, well, this this person knows somebody who works in a, um, is a respiratory therapist, and her friend um, talks about how each time before she eats her food or each time before she uh, works on a patient, she always prays. She prays before the Lord to the point that they make fun of her for it. Oh, don't you know, aren't you going to pray before you do that? And um, before, and, and, so, and so she's like, yeah, I pray before I do anything because I want the Lord to sustain me. I want the Lord, I want to take refuge in the Lord. And so, and, and, and so, do we pray? Do we come to God pleading? Do we come to him looking for refuge in our day-to-day? Because it, it, it's true that we need God to keep us every day. We need God to hold us every day, and we must pray this way. But what is it that we need protection from, right? It's the world, the flesh, the devil, right, our three enemies that we fight daily, and this has obviously been a battle since the fall of Satan, right? Since sin entered the world and has tempted all of us on a day-to-day basis. This is the battle that we're in. This is the fight that we're in, the struggle that we have. 
But David understands that he's in a battle, and he recognizes his need for a refuge. Um, one of the greatest deceptions of Satan is that we start thinking we can do this on our own. We don't even recognize half the time that we're even in a battle. We're just going on to our day-to-day lives and just trying to, you know, quote-unquote survive, you know, just to get by, and um, we don't even consider the fact that we're in a battle. And that makes us extremely vulnerable, and that's where Satan wants us to be. That's where the enemy wants us to be, because then he can control us and dictate the direction that we go in our lives. And so we don't understand our need for a refuge. We don't understand our need for protection, because we don't understand the reality of our situation. The armor alone is too heavy for us, much less the battle itself. Now, this next photo I'm going to share with you guys. I've already shared it once, but I'm going to use it again, and I was too embarrassed to, to, to reweigh myself and take it a second time because <laughs> I knew it would be a different number there. But I, but I got on the scale, right, and I, was, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, man, the armor of the Lord sure is heavy. <laughs> we need refuge in God. Yeah, exactly, because even the armor's heavy, right? It's, 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 it's a lot of weight in its own. We need to take refuge in him. We need him to sustain us. We need him to carry us. In verse 2, it says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. The Lord governs all good that comes into our lives. You know, I think, you know, most of the time, we, for some reason, have this perception of God as if he's like us. You know what I mean? And the reality is, he's not. We forget that he's all-powerful, that he's all-knowing, that he never loses control of things. Yes, certain circumstances happen, certain things happen in our lives, but God governs everything, and God is in control of everything that happens in our life, and he has the final say. He brings the final result in those things. So anything good that has happened to us comes from the Lord. And he says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. It is the Lord that governs anything good in our lives, and it is the Lord that is the good in our lives, right? It is the Lord that is good, and we need to understand that our, our need for him and that apart from him, we not only do we not have any good thing, but even if we had the good, quote unquote, things of the world, we don't have anything that's sustainable, Right? So some of you know the story in John chapter 4 that Jesus asks this Samaritan woman for a drink. And in verse 10 it says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and whom it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? And did also himself and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life life-giving water, water that is sustaining, water that you don't have to keep going back to to keep drawing from. This is the water, this is the, um, this is the good that David is referring to, is this life-giving water, the only thing that satisfies. So a lot of you guys know of Casting Crowns, one of their songs, and I have it quoted here, I have what you need, but you keep on searching. I've done all the work, but you keep on working. When you're running on empty and you can't find the remedy, just come to the well. You can spend your whole life chasing what's missing, but that empty inside just ain't going to listen. When nothing can satisfy and the world leaves you high and dry, just come to the well. The world will leave us high and dry every time. And you have God there saying, I have what you need. I have what you need. Just come to me and you'll never thirst again. You will never need again. You will never have to run to these other things for fulfillment again. It is that life-giving water. It is the only good thing that is lasting. He is the only good thing that is lasting. It is Christ alone. There's no drug. There's no drink. There's no relationship. 
that will ever satisfy and sustain us. And a lot of us have experienced that firsthand, right? No good thing. David speaks to both his total depravity and the total loss in that the world has, in what the world has to offer, right? So not only, right, are these things of the world no good thing, and outside of God there's no good thing, but David also understands that even in himself there's no good thing, right? And any of us that have tried to do good and tried to do good and tried to do things right on our own, we realize I'm really messed up. I'm really not a good person. I'm really not any of these things that I try to be, and I keep finding myself doing things that I don't want to do, and we realize our total depravity. And this is what David sees too. So not only is there no good in the world, but even in ourselves, there's no good thing. There is nothing good in us and nothing good outside of us, outside of Christ. Psalm 16, verse 3 tells us, I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. So David here is referencing the body of believers, right? The saints, those who, um, you know, those who are walking their walk daily with the Lord and the struggles that come with that. Now, this next quote that I have, um, it's from a commentary with uh, Dr. Thomas Constable, and it's referencing John, John Calvin. Calvin, personally, I don't stand on the side of Calvinism when it comes to um, my beliefs with the Scripture, um, but this was a good quote that I wanted to use, and it says, in, in reference to David referring to the church, to the body of believers, We ought, therefore, highly to value and esteem the true and devoted servants of God, and to regard nothing as of greater importance than to connect ourselves with their society. And this we will actually do if we wisely reflect in what true excellence and dignity consists, and do not allow the vain splendor of the world in its deceitful pomps to dazzle our eyes. Right? We, o- we often overlook the church. We often overlook the body of believers that are struggling every day and suffering every day to fight the good fight, to walk the good walk, to stay sober-minded and to stay clean and to try to say, Lord, I'm gonna pursue you. I'm gonna drop these things of the world. I'm not gonna continue in the ways of the world. But we struggle and we suffer in that sanctification process growing closer to the Lord. We often overlook those believers. And so David here is recognized, as I say to the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Right? David's recognizing that suffering. He's recognizing that struggle. In verse 4, it tells us, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. What's the result of running to the world for satisfaction? Yep, disappointing. And I think death, right? And I, and I think each and every person in here would have a different answer to that um, with how what's happened to us when we tried to do that and how it blew up in our face and how it destroyed our families and how it um, completely drew us away from God and led us to total desperation and, um, and loneliness and hopeless, hopelessness. What is the result of running to the world for satisfaction? Right? Well, the verse tells us, right? Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. See, the problem is in our daily walks, we look at things from a fleshly standpoint. And we don't look at things from a spiritual standpoint, Right? We don't walk around thinking, oh, well, I'm serving other gods. I'm worshiping other gods, right? A lot of us were raised in the church. A lot of us were raised to be, you know, Christian or to be believers. And so, you know, when, you, when somebody comes to you and says, you know, you're worshiping a false god. No, not me. I grew up in church. You know, and a lot of times we don't realize that the things that we're putting before God, whether it be the alcohol, the drugs, or... Um, our relationships or anything that we put before God and say, hey, you know, this is my number one priority. I don't care what God says. I don't care what he thinks. I'm going to do it. It's my life, and I'm going to run my things, my life the way that I want to run my life. 
anything that we do, that, that becomes our God. That becomes, I, that, that, that becomes an idol. We, we begin to worship those types of things in our lives. And so anytime that we go off that path that God has for us and we seek satisfaction in anything that is outside of him, then what's the result? It says that we will suffer more and more. A lot of people, you'll hear them say, we weren't given a handbook for life, right? How many, how many of you guys are familiar with Jeff Foxworthy? Yeah, he says, here's your sign. So, you know, <laughs> the Bible lays it out for us, man. And the, the incredible thing about the Word of God is, like I said before, is it is the living Word. You know, if you read a verse here and you read a verse there, it's not going to make any sense to you. It's not going to be able to break it down. But when you read and you study and you meditate on the Word um, like, like we should, and as David does, then you start seeing the full picture of the Word. And you start seeing how it's alive and how it's alive you know, not only in the text, but also alive in our day-to-day lives, and that God has given us this handbook. So many things. I mean, all the way back to all life is in the blood, or, you know, the the, the Bible talks about the roundness of the earth and how it's um, under his feet. And, you know, um, there's just so many things throughout the Scripture that was already talked about, that God laid out, that, um, that, that, that he's given us the answers for, and we look right over it. He has given us a handbook. We're just not looking in the right places because, again, we're trying to do it our way. Verse 5 tells us, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The, the amazing thing about this psalm is he re-references a lot of things. And, like, uh, he, he, he really goes back and ties everything in and you know, even in songwriting, you'll see that, right? You'll see how they tie the verses in with the chorus, and the chorus, or chorus references back the verses, and it's poetic. And it's incredible that you see this here, because again, he's talking about, um, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. He's referencing the cup, just like he was pouring about, out the cup before when he was talking about um, the pagans and they're following their false gods. And so, you know, it's very poetic, but it says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. So David, like I was saying, he, he, he uses a metaphor here to describe drinking the cup of God, um, his fulfilling portion versus the pagans, like we were talking about, who literally drink the blood and worship of false gods, right? It's very poetic in the metaphor that he uses here that he's saying that God, no, I see them run into these other gods. I see them run into this alcohol. I know the times that I ran to these other things and I drink of this sin, and I brought these things into my life, but now I know, God, that you are my portion, that I don't need to drink the blood of these other gods, that I don't need to consume myself with these things, God, but you fulfill me, you sustain me, you give me that life-giving water. In the second portion of this, it says that you make my lot secure, and what's David talking about with his lot, right? Right? When we talk about a lot, we're talking about land, we're talking about an inheritance, right? So David foresaw both his inheritance in this life and the inheritance to come, right? Again, David has a perception that is larger than what's in front of him. David has a perception that is larger than the physical, and this is the perception that we have to get to, where the Bible says that we have to renew our minds, right? That, 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 that through the Holy Spirit and the washing of the Word, that we are to study, we're to meditate, and we need to renew our minds to think in the spiritual realm. And David does this. So he sees it on a larger thing, not just of a physical inheritance, but also the inheritance that was to come for eternity. And then again, it goes into still talking about boundary lines, right? Talking about lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely... I have a delightful inheritance, right? David's tying all this together still. So David makes the comparison here between like a worldly property line, right, and a piece of land such as that which was promised to Israel, right? We got to get out of the mentality of just the physical but also the spiritual, that God always has a larger plan than we can even understand without his perception. And so he's making the comparison here. He says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, David's not just talking about a physical property line. 
You know, he's also, he's talking about an eternal inheritance um, in, in which, it, which is God himself for eternity, right? And that's, that's the hope that each of us have. That's what David foresees when he's saying this, not just a physical property line, not just a mansion on a hill, not just a worldly inheritance, but an inheritance with God forever, that life-giving, that sustaining water. And in verse 2, he says, I say to the Lord, you are, my ref- you are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing, right? It is God himself for eternity that is the only thing that's going to sustain us. Verse 7 tells us, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. Again, we were referencing the scripture where it says, um, study the word, meditate on it, day and night, right? So not only, you know, I asked before, do we pray? Do we go to the Lord? Do we say, God, you are my refuge. God, sustain me. God, give me strength. But we also, but also, do we do this day and night? Do we do it in the morning when we start our day? Do we do it as we're going through our day? Do we lay down and meditate on the Lord? Do we lay down and meditate on God? Thank you for the things that you've done for me. Thank you for the blessings that you have in my life. God, thank you for the trials, the tribulations, the struggles that you are sanctifying me in and molding me into the image of your son. Is that our perception? Is that our thought process? Or are we too busy gossiping? Are we too busy complaining about, I'm sick of how things are going in my life. I'm sick of the pain that I'm in all the time. I'm sick of my family and my kids not treating me right. I'm sick of everything that's going on in my life. Nothing's going my way, and I'm sick and tired of it. One of the greatest lessons that I've learned and continue to learn in my life is there's not one thing in my life that went the way that I thought it was going to go. My life is, and the older I get, the more that I realize that, and the more that I understand that, that it has all worked out for my good. But I had this whole plan as a kid. I was going to be, you know, I was going to go to, I was going to graduate high school. I was never going to go to jail. I was never going to go through any kind of marital problems. I was just going to have this white picket fence life because I was going to do everything the right way. And let me tell you, my life got turned upside down and it did not work that way. But the Lord said, no, these are the things that's going to happen. This is the path that you're going to take. And you're going to be better for my kingdom for it. And I'm going to mold you and I'm going to teach you and I'm going to grow you and I'm going to heal you. And he did, just like a father does with his children, right? And that's what he's continued to do. And so David, just like myself, sees that, Lord, all that was hard and nothing went the way I thought it was going to, but you have sustained me, right? So those are the things at night we need to meditate on. We need to understand. We need to think about, Lord, you've counseled me, and you've led me this way. This didn't make any sense, and I don't know how this happened, and I didn't know how I was going to get out of that storm, but here I am. I'm standing here. You must still have a plan for me, right? You must still have a purpose for me, and I promise you that as long as you have breath in your lungs, that God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. You know, he knew that when he knitted you in your mother's womb, Like, God has a purpose in the plan. You are unique. You are special. And he has that that love and that compassion for us, not just for us all as a whole. We hear John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But he loves us individually. And so we need to meditate on those things at night. We need to understand those things at night and to remind ourselves of these things at night. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to always pray, um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Um, I was so afraid back then. I gave my life to the Lord at nine years old, and I, had, I didn't really understand, you know, the scriptures or doctrine and things like that at that point. And so I would be so afraid because I would mess up. I would either yell at one of my brothers or push them down or, you know, I would lie or cover something up or hide. And I would be so afraid to go to sleep because I was like, God, I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to be with you. You know what I mean? I might not, I might not wake up. I might die. And I thought like that, and I, and I really did. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I thought that was like a magic thing that was going to, you know, make the Lord just wash everything away and say, um, you know, he's gonna, he, he'll take me if I don't wake up tonight. And, uh, but, you know, as a kid, you know, that's, that, that's, that's how I thought. But, you know, we should have those thoughts when we lay down at night, just like in the mornings, every day. Every, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. We need to continue in prayer with the Lord, because not only we, we, you won't know the benefits of it until you do it. 
And when you do it every day, it'll change every aspect of your life. I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night. My heart instructs me. So this is from the book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. And the reason that I want to bring these quotes up is because I want to paint the picture, like I said in the beginning, our need for God, right? You, don't, you, you can't run to God and ask him to sustain you if you don't understand why it is that you need sustaining, number one. And secondly, um, you don't understand the power that God has to sustain us and how he molds everything together. So it says, the marvelous human body holds endlessly fascinating secrets. The resilience of skin, the strength and structure of bones, the dynamic balance of muscles, our physical being is knit according to a pattern of stunning purpose, right? Everything with the body, if you've ever done anything medical or, um, you know, understand anything about the body, that God completely holds all this together, and that if it wasn't for our, our, our bones and our skin, I mean, you know how many I mean, I think I've mentioned this before in one of my other messages, but I mean, any of you that have seen that uh, show, A Thousand Ways to Die? It's an endless number of ways that we could actually die. I don't know how we actually sustain. I mean, even for a cell itself to survive is incredible in itself, you know what I mean? Especially to get to where we're at in the scheme of things, that God just holds all this together. And so our body stays in a, um, a state which is called homeostasis. Right? And that means that everything is good in our body. All the balances are there, all the levels are there, everything is where it's supposed to be, that we can sustain life. Right? And so homeostasis refers to the remarkable system that keeps the body's environment stable. For instance, when I step outdoors, whether the temperature is 100 degrees or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, my internal temperature will stay approximately the same. Once again, the body finds a way to mobilize all its cells to work together for a common cause. Like, how incredible is that? That we can walk out and live and survive, right? The, 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 that God holds our very breath and everything that we do in his hands and that he is the giver of life. You know, one of, the, one of the things in the Old Testament, like it talks about like how all life is in the blood, right? It wasn't until years later that they discovered DNA and they discovered about all these diseases that we have now, and they're like, oh, this is, this is like, this is bloodborne pathogens. This is this, and this is that. It was already talked about in the scriptures, right? I mean, things like, you know, washing your hands under running water, right? They didn't until back in the day, they were washing their hands in basins and going woman to woman to give birth, and these people were dying. Babies were dying because they weren't washing their hands under running water. God, as a father to the Israelites, gave them these rules to sustain them and to direct them on how they should live their life. God already laid all this out in the scriptures. And so all life is in the blood, right? Everything has a system. Everything's built for a reason. Everything's in, in complete structure and order. It's us that causes chaos, right, in the midst of everything. And, nine, and really, God still didn't lose control. It's chaos in our minds, chaos in our heart. It's our anxiety for lack of faith that we struggle with in this. So, but God has already laid it out. If we understand who God is, then we can deal with the anxiety. We can deal with the stress. We can deal with those hormones and emotions that we try to run to the drugs for because we can rest, right? We can rest easy in the midst of trials. We can rest easy in the midst of our pain, Life is fragile, and we are fragile, right? Get pride out of the way. If you think you got it together, you're wrong. If you think you're not struggling, you're wrong. And a good example of that is the moment that you say, I have it together, or the moment you say that I'm struggling, you're in the wrong just by saying that, right? You're, 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 you're bringing yourself, you're allowing pride to speak for you, and you don't realize your own depravity. That even if we have everything that life has to offer, we're still filthy rags compared to the riches and the grace of God, right? And compared to that life-giving water. And so we need to understand that we are fragile, that we need sustaining. David understands this. Christ is the only sustaining factor. He is what holds it all together. So this is, again, from Dr. Constable's study notes. He says, someone has said that if you have trouble sleeping, don't count the sheep, but talk to the shepherd right? Talk to the Lord. Go to sleep talking to the Lord. 
Go to sleep expressing yourself to the Lord. If you're angry, tell him, God, I'm upset. I'm frustrated. Things aren't going my way. Don't you get it? Don't you understand? Go to sleep crying, right? Cry on your pillow. Lord, I'm hurt. I'm broken. I'm struggling. But talk to him. Talk to the shepherd. The sheep's not going to do anything for you. But the shepherd will lead you out of the storm that you're in. And even if he doesn't has to lead you through the storm, he'll sustain you through that, right? Verse 8 tells us, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. David kept his eyes on the Lord to keep from losing direction, right? Taking our eyes off of him inevitably leaves us blinded and lost, right? If we go our own way, we don't even know where we're going half the time. You know, what's your plan in life? What's your five-year goal? Where am I going for this? What am I doing for this? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I figure, YOLO, you only live once. Let's just run it out and do whatever we want to do, and I guess I'll land somewhere, right? And then before you know it, you wake up, and, you know, you're, you're sitting there, and you're looking around you, and you realize that life, in the blink of an eye, has passed you by, right? And you had no purpose. You haven't accomplished anything. You haven't done anything of reason. You have no legacy, right? Life has just passed you by because we had no direction, right? Everything, as I said, has a purpose. God is a God of order. God is a God of structure. And since the foundation of the earth, he knew and put everything into place. And so we need to keep our eyes on the Lord, just as David's saying, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. David expresses the Lord is at his right hand, signifying that he's seated in the highest place of honor, right? Again, David's recognizing the authority and the power of God. There is none more honorable. He is the only good thing. If God be for us, who can be against us, right? Isn't that what the scripture says? David's understanding that. David sees that I will not be shaken, right? To get to a point of confidence, right, to say, I'm, I'm struggling today, but, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it today or not. But to get to a point of confidence to say, I will not be shaken. Oh, wow, that's bold of you to say. Oh, no, 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 let me explain. I'm not saying that I won't be shaken. World will, the world will um, chew me up and spit me out and kick me and stomp me while I'm on the ground. And I don't have anything to be able to sustain that or do that. But no, I will not be shaken because God will sustain me. That no matter what I face, no matter you know, how, how much it chews me up and spits me out and kicks me down, God will still sustain me. And this is the understanding that David has. And even with Samson, right? Samson, just with the Spirit of the Lord, he killed a thousand Philistines with a donkey jawbone, right? It says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, right? With the Lord for us, who can be against us? We will not be shaken, Psalm um, 16, verses 9 through 10, it says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Do you see the level of confidence that David has when he's saying these things? He's not questioning it. God, I hope you don't let me go when I die. You know, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I sure hope he welcomes me in. No, he has confidence, right? The Bible says that once you're sealed, you're sealed to the day of redemption because it's not by works that any man should boast, but it is by grace and grace alone, right? It's everything to do with Christ and nothing to do with us. God, here I am in my total depravity. Please work in me. Please fix me. You can, and when you are in that humble state, then you can have this confidence because it is not our strength, it is his strength, right? For when I am made weak, Paul says, then I am strong. And so therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. So Peter references Psalm 16, and I want to make a parallel here between, um, you know, David not seeing decay and David... Um, you know, resting, a, re, resting secure, as he, as he mentions here. Uh, in Acts it tell, chapter 2, it tells us, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently 
that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. How incredible is that? Jeff, do you know how long it was between like the Psalms and uh, where Peter was here in Acts? Approximately? I know it was like hundreds of years, right? I know it was a very, I didn't want, I didn't want to, I, Jeff's going to look it up. I didn't want to say it incorrectly. But the fact that God, that, that David can prophesy the coming of the Christ, right? Remember, like I said, David wasn't just in a fleshly mindset. He was in a spiritual mindset with everything that he's saying in this psalm. And he knew of the coming Christ that God had promised would come from the lineage of David, right? To one day stand on the throne. There was no longer a king in Israel, right? The kings of Israel had come and gone at that point, and it was Jesus himself that was later established as the king of Israel, right? And so God came and put Jesus on the throne. They were looking for some ruler, right, that was going to overthrow, um, overthrow Rome. And uh, that's not the way that God, again, God flipped it all upside down and mixed it all up, and he had a plan that was greater than we could ever imagine. And so about a thousand years. How incredible is that? Yeah, I think we just talked about that. Um, so yeah, the um, so so a thousand years, man. That's incredible that 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 that, that David foresaw these things. That, that he was able to prophesy the coming of the Christ. He foresaw the life giving water. He saw what was to come, and he believed what the Lord had spoken unto him. And in Luke chapter 1, we know the story of Mary, right? When Jesus was born, it says that the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. God has shown you his grace. Listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his ancestor. He will rule over the people of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. This is the inheritance, right? This is the inheritance that God was speaking of that was much larger than just a plot of land. Verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with your joy, with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. Does that sound familiar from earlier in the passage? right, where David says that the Lord is at his right hand, right? In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with your joy in the presence. Again, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life that God was making known to David, that God now makes known to us the way to spend eternity with God forever and, and, to, and to have that final place where we no longer suffer and we no longer have pain and we no longer struggle, but we are sustained in absolute worship with God forever. That is the greatest reward. Jesus is the greatest reward to all of these trials, to all of this that we're going through. It all, and it all circles back to abiding in the Lord, Right? Because that's where we're headed, right? To abide in the Lord, to be under his protection, to be under his refuge, and to spend eternity with him. A quote from Charles Spurgeon says, If Christ is not all to you, he is nothing to you. He will never go into partnership as a part savior of men. If he be something, he must be everything. And if he be not everything, he is nothing to you. Right? Outside of him, there is no good thing. Anything that we're running to, it's never going to sustain us. In conclusion, how incredibly poetic, and I mentioned this a second ago, is it that David refers to God in verse 8 being at David's right hand, the highest place of honor, 
And he ends with verse 11 by referring to his eternal pleasure at God's right hand. David is foretelling us being seated at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus, right? The highest place of honor. Because of us? Because we did good? Because we ran our race and we did everything that we were supposed to do? No, because of Christ and Christ alone. Stop running to all the things the world has to offer. It is Christ and Christ alone that will bring fulfillment in our lives. If this doesn't make a believer out of you that somebody can say something a thousand years ago to foretell the coming of Jesus Christ for the world, I don't know what will. I mean, there's scripture where, where, where um, I believe it's, um, darn, Lazarus, where they're talking about the story of Lazarus, when he says, um, where he says, well, 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 can't you go warn them? Can't you go tell them? And he's like, well, I've sent the prophets, and they didn't listen, and they're not going to listen now, right? How much do we need to be told? How much truth needs to be before us before we believe, right? We need to surrender our lives, and we need to bring ourselves to the mercy of God, understand our depravity, and say, God, sustain me.